Hello, uh, welcome back to me talking about stuff that I fancy talking about, <laughs> which this week happens to be umbilical arteries and vein. Two arteries, one vein. Obviously the, um, the umbilical cord we're talking about, so how the, um, the fetus is attached to the placenta, the placenta being the organ of gaseous exchange and nutrition and that sort of thing for the fetus. And inside the umbilical cord we find two umbilical arteries and one vein, hence the emphasis. Um, but how we, where do they come from? How, what do they become? As in, how are they hooked into the circuitry system of the fetus? And after birth, where do they go? What do they become? And I've been uh, rummaging around in our collection of models and I found some things. Um, okay, so the umbilical cord, which we can just about see in there on the model. Um, here is um, the placenta. So there's the umbilical cord there running from the placenta to the fetus. And we can see there is one large red vessel and two smaller blue vessels. So the large red vessel is the umbilical vein vein because it is carrying blood towards the fetal heart, red because it is carrying well oxygenated blood to the fetus. There's a whole bunch of interesting physiological things. Fetal haemoglobin, for example, is more effective at holding on to oxygen than the mother's haemoglobin, so it pulls oxygen from the mother's blood to the fetal blood. Um, there's also some acidity and alkalinity that pulls oxygen across. Um, but the oxygen saturation of the fetal blood is lower than the oxygen saturation of the maternal blood. So obviously that, that, that pulls the oxygen into the fetal blood as well. Anyway, stop talking about physiology, Sam. The umbilical vein is single and painted red because it is carrying well oxygenated blood into the fetus from the placenta and it's carrying blood full of nutrients into the fetus into the fetal circulation. Um, the maternal blood and the fetal blood don't mix. Uh, gases and molecules diffuse across and what have you. And then the two blue structures are the umbilical arteries. Arteries because they are carrying blood away from the fetal heart. And blue because they're carrying poorly oxygenated blood back to the Placenta. I mean, that's not entirely true. So the, the, the blood in the umbilical arteries has the same sort of oxygen concentration as most of the arterial blood in the fetus. So it's not like as clear cut as going to the lungs and anyway, but that's why they're blue and red. Wah! Clearly, there's the umbilicus. So that's where the umbilical cord was when this plastic model was a fetus. Um, so that's where the umbilical artery and veins were. Now the umbilical vein goes in here and on the, uh, oh, on the other side of the anterior abdominal wall then, the umbilical vein runs up the, um, the deep surface of the anterior abdominal wall. Now the liver here is attached to the anterior abdominal wall by the falciform ligament. The peritoneum, that comes off the posterior abdominal wall, goes around the stomach, continues as the lesser omentum, goes around the liver, uniquely at this level, then continues into the anterior abdominal wall. Very helpful because the liver is a big heavy organ and the falciform ligament anchors the liver to the anterior wall, holds it in place. So the, um, the umbilical vein in the fetus enters at the umbilicus and then runs up within the falciform ligament to the liver. And then at the liver, the uh, umbilical vein will then give off a number of branches. So several branches will enter the liver. There's usually a branch that attaches to the, port the hepatic portal vein. Um, so the, a lot of the blood from the umbilical vein goes through the liver. Now this makes sense, doesn't it? Because all of the um, blood from the gastrointestinal tract goes to the liver and the hepatocytes get first dibs on it because that's many of the jobs of the hepatocytes are involved in um, taking the nutrients that you've absorbed and then doing stuff with them. So that 
placental blood comes into the liver um, and passes through the hepatocytes, through the liver, um, or past the hepatocytes and through the liver to then get into the um, inferior vena cava and then into the heart and off around the body. But there's also a little extra adaptation here. It's called the ductus venosus. So the ductus venosus is a branch from the umbilical vein that will carry blood around the liver, so that blood doesn't go through the liver, doesn't encounter hepatocytes. The ductus venosus takes blood around the liver and then sends it into the inferior vena cava or maybe even one of the hepatic um, veins as they go into the inferior vena cava. Uh, now, um, of the liver, that's the chordate lobe, that's the left lobe, so in this crease in here, that's often where we'd find the, um, the ductus venosus. We used to say that the ductus venosus takes about half of the blood of the umbilical vein around the liver instead of through the liver. Um, more recent research suggests that about 70% of the blood of the umbilical vein actually goes through the liver and about 30% around the liver. It's different in other animals. What happens to these after birth? The umbilical vein stops being a vein. Um, Obviously after birth, it's disconnected from the placenta. There's no more blood coming in through the umbilical vein. So the umbilical vein becomes a fibrous cord. It becomes the round ligament of the liver or the uh, ligamentum teres hepatis, the round ligament of the liver. And it continues to run where it ran in the fetus, which is in the falciform ligament. So well, we'd see it in the anterior abdominal wall in the falciform ligament running up to the liver up here. The um, ductus venosus, um, the ductus venosus stops being a vein as well and the ductus venosus also becomes a fibrous cord, the ligamentum venosum, and you might find it in the lesser omentum in this, uh, in this crease between the left lobe of the liver and the chordate lobe of the liver. Um, and you might find it as a branch or a, you know, connected to the round ligament of the liver. Um, we talked about portosystemic anastomoses before and how you can, if the liver becomes fibrosed, you can see alternate routes that blood takes if it can't get, it, it can't get through the liver. And we talked about um, caput medusae and the, um, the, the portosystemic anastomosis around the umbilicus. That's not the um, umbilical ligament opening back up and becoming a vein again, that is para-umbilical veins carrying blood in the opposite direction back to the umbilical ball. Anyway, okay, arteries. The umbilical arteries, well, we're gonna have to dissect um, and take out a whole bunch of organs and get very posterior. Um, so we have the aorta, becomes the common iliac arteries, and each common iliac artery will divide into an internal iliac artery and an external iliac artery. The external iliac artery continues onto the lower limb. The internal iliac artery goes into the pelvis to supply blood to the organs of the pelvis. And we talk about an anterior trunk or anterior division, um, giving off branches to those organs. And it's that, the anterior division of the internal iliac artery gives off the umbilical arteries. And the umbilical arteries run around the, um, the bladder and they run to the anterior abdominal wall and they run up the deep surface, the internal surface of the anterior abdominal wall and they run to the umbilicus. And bam, you've got your two umbilical arteries. So then the umbilical arteries are branches of the internal iliac artery. And this is what I mean when I say that the quality of the blood in the umbilical arteries is representative. It's similar to the quality of the blood, uh, of the arterial blood of the fetus as a whole. It's not like it's gone through all the tissues of the body and then goes to the placenta. Okay, so what happens to the umbilical arteries after birth then? So I found another model, this is a male pelvis, and in here, there's the bladder, and we can see, so there's the anterior abdominal wall. Um, the arteries going in there will be the, there we go, the internal iliac artery, and we can, I can see on this model, it's not labeled, um, but I can see a ridge running up here, and a ridge in the midline as well. Now that 
that ridge there, that is what was the right umbilical artery. So the umbilical arteries, as I say, they ran around the bladder, continued up the anterior abdominal wall to the umbilicus and off to the placenta. So after birth, those um umbilical arteries form clots, blood doesn't flow through them, and again, they stop being arteries and they become fibrous cords. They become what we call ligaments. So what we see here is the medial umbilical ligament. Um, so there are two medial umbilical ligaments, one on either side. So those were the two umbilical arteries. So that part of the umbilical artery degenerates and becomes a fibrous cord, but proximal to that, it remains an artery. And right here, you've got the bladder and you've got the superior part of the bladder. And the arteries that supply blood to the bladder are called the vesicle arteries. Vesicle means like a like a bladder, like a fluid-filled sac. So these are the superior vesical arteries. The superior vesical arteries are formed from the umbilical arteries. Now, a high-level tip here, don't confuse the medial umbilical ligaments with the median umbilical li ligament. Median means in the midline, on the median. Medial just means towards the midline, because yes, there are lateral umbilical ligaments, which are, are actually, can we see them on here? No, they're the inferior epigastric vessels raising up the uh, peritoneum. Anyway, so the umbilical arteries become the two medial umbilical ligaments that run within the anterior abdominal wall up to the umbilicus. The median umbilical ligament is actually a, a it runs in the midline up to the umbilicus, and that is a remnant of the uracus. The uracus is a is an embryonic structure. It's attached to the bladder in the adult. So medial umbilical ligaments were the umbilical arteries. Medial. As this is a male model, um, the artery to the ductus deferens often also comes from the superior vesical artery. Um, all right, so that's the anatomy of the umbilical vein, the two umbilical arteries, where they come from, where they go to, what they're for, what they do, what they become after birth. Clinical stuff, um, sometimes there is only one umbilical artery. I think in about 1% of pregnancies, there's only one umbilical artery and one umbilical vein. Most of the time this is fine, one umbilical artery is enough to, to take blood to the placenta. Some of the times there are other developmental changes which are associated with the single umbilical artery which can cause problems, but it's not the same. I don't think it's the, the single umbilical artery itself that causes the problem. So there's that variation. But otherwise, that's the anatomy of the umbilical arteries and the umbilical veins, uh, which become the medial umbilical ligaments and the round ligament of the liver and now you understand why. I think it's pretty neat the way the way all that works but anyway okay cool right uh, see you next week when I come up with another inane topic to talk about. Mm -hmm.